A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindi newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 6th of October 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this front page article. It talks about two Nobel prizes, one for the physics and the other for chemistry. To be very specific, three scientists they have won Nobel prize in chemistry for the discovery of click chemistry, and three other scientists they have won the prize in physics for their advances in the quantum mechanics. See, this is about the news article given here. In this article discussion, we are going to understand what is click chemistry. Just by hearing the name click. Don't assume that it is a mouse click. See, the term click chemistry was introduced by Barry Sharpless in the year 2001, and it refers to a group of reactions that are fast, simple to use, and give high product yields. Here, the word click implies that molecules can be linked together just as quickly as mechanical snap fasteners. So, this click resembles the seat belt in cars or aircrafts. Here, the molecules they are linked together as quickly as the mechanical snap fastness. Remember, apart from being simple to use, a click reaction should be versatile, highly reliable, and applicable to small scale and large scale production. And most importantly, the reagents should be readily available. So we know that chemists they often try to recreate complex chemical molecules that are found in nature, right? in that way click chemistry has its application in the field of medicine that is it is used in how to target and block the pathogens in the cells see this application is significant because the usual process which is based on carbon hetero bond formation is complicated and time consuming so to overcome this shortcoming the nobel prize winners instead of trying to react the resistant carbon atoms with one another they just began the reaction with smaller molecules that already had a full carbon frame and this yielded them positive results with such simple reactions the scientists they could achieve not only a strong intrinsic drive for the molecules to bond together but also avoid many of the side reactions with the minimal loss of material So what does this imply this implies that click reaction stimulates strong intrinsic drive for the molecules to bond together and that is why it is significant see one among the scientists says that even if click chemistry cannot provide exact copies of the natural molecules it will be able to find out molecules that fulfill the same functions so this offers us insights into cell biology I hope you understand what is click chemistry here. See click chemistry it is a group of reactions that are fast, simple to use and it should give high product yields and that is why the name click. Just like that it should happen and it should be versatile, highly reliable and applicable to small scale and large scale production. Its application is in medicine to target and block pathogens in the cells and it also offers insights into cell biology. and with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about the nobel prize for medicine see this year the nobel prize for medicine will be awarded to swante pebo he is a swedish geneticist and a director of the max planck institute for evolutionary anthropology in germany In spite of multiple winners for every prize, Pebo has been chosen as the lone winner of the medicine or physiology prize. See, this is something which has not been witnessed since the year 2016. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the research of Pebo that earned him the Nobel prize. See Pebo will be awarded Nobel Prize for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. See hominins they are nothing but species closely related to humans. So Pebo he studied the genomes of extinct hominins and the human evolution. See we know that humanity has always been intrigued by its origins. That is 
questions like where did we come from and how are we related to those who came before us and what makes us is homo sapiens different from other hominins all these questions they always come to our mind so in this line pebo accomplished something that seems impossible so what is it see he sequenced the genome of a neanderthal see neanderthals they are an extant relative of present day humans we all know present day humans they are homo sapiens so neanderthal they are the extant relative of homo sapiens and pebo he also made the sensational discovery of a previously unknown hominin which is called as denisova and most importantly pebo also found that gene transfer had occurred from these extant hominins to homo sapiens so he found out that gene transfer had occurred from neanderthals and denisova to homo sapiens and this occurred through migration out of africa around 70000 years ago see this ancient flow of genes to present day humans has physiological relevance today for example it affects how our immune system reacts to infections see pebo his seminal research gave rise to an entirely new scientific discipline which is paleogenomics Here, paleogenomics is a field of science based on reconstruction and analysis of genomic information in extinct species. And what Pebo did is, by revealing the genetic differences, he provided the basis for exploring what makes us uniquely human. And thus, his research provided evidence that the anatomically modern human, that is the Homo sapiens, they first appeared in Africa approximately. 3 lakh years ago while our closest known relatives that is the neanderthals developed outside africa and they populated europe and western asia from around 4 lakh years and this happened until 30000 years ago and at that point they went extinct see about 70000 years ago groups of homo sapiens migrated from africa to middle east and from there they spread to the rest of the world See Homo sapiens and Neanderthals they coexisted in large parts of Eurasia for tens and thousands of years. Thus by sequencing the genomic DNA the relationship between present day humans and the extinct Neanderthals was accomplished. See I'll give you one more information here. The first Neanderthal genome sequence was published in the year 2010. and comparative analysis demonstrated that most recent common ancestor of neanderthals and homo sapiens lived around 8 lakh years ago and thus we can say that pebo's discoveries have generated new understanding of our evolutionary history and for this ground breaking discovery he was awarded the nobel prize for medicine and don't forget that his new scientific discipline is the paleogenomics now with these information let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this editorial article this article talks about the governor's assent to a legislative bill see this is done to make the bill into a law see the news here talks about the governors of some states who are delaying that assent This is by either withholding their assent or by reserving the bill for president. See all the constitutional authorities are required to act in a reasonable manner. This is obvious, right? So most often a question arises after such delaying acts of governors. So what is that question? Is this kind of unreasonable procrastination constitutional? So this is the question that arises because of the delaying acts of the governors and this is the crux of this editorial article in this context let us first learn about constitutional provision available to the governor with regards to a bill after this let us see what are the issues in governor's power with regards to a constitutional bill and finally we'll see a comparison of the same with the US and the UK governments But before that the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference please go through it Now first of all let us see the governor's power with regards to a bill Now take article 200 of Indian constitution 
See, according to this article, when a bill has been passed by the state legislative assembly and also by the state legislative council, it has to be presented to the governor. Why it has to be presented to the governor? Because it will become an act after the governor gives his assent to the bill. Now, what all can the governor do with this bill? The governor can give his or her assent to the bill. And the second option is to withhold the assent. And the third option is to reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. And the fourth option is the governor may return the bill to the houses. See, this is possible only to the bill which is not a money bill. And also note that this option should be done soon after the presentation of bill for the assent. And let us say that the governor has returned the bill to the houses. See, when a bill is returned like this, the legislative body of the state should reconsider the bill within six months. And if the bill is passed again by the house with or without any amendment and presented to the governor for assent, in this case, the governor should not withhold his assent. What does this mean? This means that the governor must give his or her assent. But note that in this case also, the governor has the option of reserving the bill for the consideration of the president. But while doing this, the opinion of the governor should justify that if the bill becomes a law, it derogates the powers of the high court or it endangers the position of the court. So the provision is that the governor cannot reserve the bill for the consideration of the president as and when he wishes. He should justify that the bill derogates the powers of the High Court and endangers its position. Now the bill has been reserved for the consideration of the President. And what can the President do with this? See, President have two options to do with the reserved bills. One is to give his or her assent. The other one is again to withhold the assent. So what can we understand from this? We can understand that the governor's or the president's assent becomes the most crucial act in the whole lawmaking process. So this is about giving assent to a bill. Now let us come to the issues. See the issue here is the unreasonable or the unconstitutional reasons given by the governor of some states while reserving a bill for president or in some cases while withholding their assent. See, this act of the governors, it is very unconstitutional because the lawmaking process ends with the assent of the governor or the president. That's what we saw so far, right? So, when there is no proper justification for reserving or withholding the assent, the entire lawmaking process becomes questionable. For example, in Kerala, the governor publicly announced that he would not give the assent to the Lok Ayukta Amendment Bill and the Kerala University Amendment Bill. Such actions by the governors questions the constitutionality of the legislative programs of the governments. Thus, the question of whether a governor is permitted by the constitution to cause uncertainty in the matters of giving assent to the bills assumes great importance. Now let us see what happens in USA and UK. See, even in the United Kingdom, the royal assent is necessary for a bill to become a law and the crown has the power to withhold assent. But it is a dead letter. What is the meaning of this? See, by practice and usage, there is no power of veto exercised by the crown in England. Moreover, the refusal of royal assent on the ground that the monarchy strongly disapproves the bill or that the bill is very controversial, is treated as unconstitutional. So this is the case in United Kingdom. And in the United States, the president is empowered by the constitution to refuse assent and return a bill to the house. But if the house again passes it with two-thirds of majority in each house, then the bill becomes the law. See, in this discussion, we are talking about giving assent to the bill and the power to withhold the assent the power to reserve the bill for consideration of the president. So while discussing this, let us also learn about the different types of veto powers. See, there are three types of veto power. They are absolute veto, suspensive veto and pocket veto. The first one is absolute veto. See, it refers to the power of the president to withhold his assent to a bill passed by the parliament. And the bill then ends and does not become an act. So this is absolute veto. The second one is suspensive veto. Here only what we saw happens. 
the president returns the bill to the indian parliament for reconsideration and if the parliament reasons the bill with or without any amendment to the president he has to approve the bill without using any of his veto powers this is suspensive veto he can return the bill once but here you have to know what happens with the reserved state bills see we know that the governor is empowered to reserve certain types of bills passed by the state legislature for the consideration of the president right so after this the governor will not have any further role in the enactment of the reserved bill and the president he or she can withhold his assent to such bills not only in the first instance but also in the second instance also see this means that the president enjoys absolute veto and not suspensive veto over the state bills and one more thing the president can exercise pocket veto in respect of state legislation but the governor cannot exercise this pocket veto now what is pocket veto see the bill is kept pending by the president for an indefinite period what does this mean this means that the president neither rejects the bill nor returns the bill for reconsideration he is just keeping it in his pocket and that's what this pocket veto means and remember that president can only exercise pocket veto in respect to state legislation governor cannot exercise pocket veto and one more crucial fact you have to remember is president enjoys absolute veto over state bills now here let us see one more scenario see when you take the american president he or she he has to rescind the bill within 10 days but indian president has no such time rule this is for sending the bill for reconsideration so remember these facts this will be useful for your prelims examination so with all of this information now we are going to see some of the exceptions see the president cannot exercise his suspensive veto in relation to the money bill that means he cannot send the bill to the parliament for reconsideration and also know that the president has no veto power at all when it comes to constitutional amendment bills he has no other go he has to give the assent see this was clearly specified after the 24th constitutional amendment and also note that the constitutional amendment bills cannot be introduced in the state legislature it can be introduced only in the parliament see all of these points you take note of it and then revise it again and again like i said already it will be useful for your prelims see you can take notes like this divide the page into two and one side write the veto powers of the president on the other side write the veto powers of the governor see president enjoys absolute veto suspensive veto and pocket veto here what are all the exceptions he has no suspensive veto in relation to money bill and he has no veto power at all when it comes to constitutional amendment bills and this was ensured after 24th constitutional amendment and we also saw that indian president has no time rule to send the bill for reconsideration and we also saw that when it comes to the reserved bills from the state president can withhold his assent not only in the first instance but also in the second instance so this is about the president's veto power on the other side write about the governor's veto power see governor enjoys absolute veto suspensive veto here also he cannot exercise these powers when it comes to money bill but know that governor cannot exercise pocket veto it is the exclusive power of the president now what is the conclusion that we can draw from the above discussion see the refusal of assent is a practice which is not followed in other democratic countries and in some context it is unconstitutional or the constitution itself provides a remedy why these remedies are there see this is to pass the bill by the legislature to make it a law even after the refusal of assent but in the case of indian constitution there is no such remedy see the courts too have more or less accepted the position that if the governor withholds the assent the bill will not become a law thus it makes the whole legislative exercise become fruitless and when we talk about questioning the unreasonable acts of the governors of some states article 361 comes into play see this article prohibits the court from initiating proceedings against a governor or president for any act done in the exercise of their powers that is they enjoy complete immunity from court proceedings see we know that 
the governor will have to disclose the reason for refusing a bill while declaring that he withholds the assent and if the grounds for the refusal is malified or extraneous considerations or ultra vires the governor's action of refusal could be struck down as unconstitutional see this point has been settled by a constitution bench of the supreme court Here the court held that the immunity granted by article 361 clause 1 does not take away the power of the court to examine the validity of the action including on the grounds of malfeasance so this means that the governor's grounds for refusal should be reasonable but of course the court will not be able to direct the governor to act in a particular way so what can be done here the governor he or she should act in a way that their actions are constitutional and reasonable and one more thing we have to discuss when it comes to giving assent is that the constitution does not fix any timeline for the governor to decide the question of assent this means that he or she can wait for any length of time without doing anything this is also illogical right See here not fixing any timeline does not mean that the governor can indefinitely sit on the bill that has been passed by an assembly. So what should the governor do here? He should exercise one of the options given in the article 200. See in the beginning of the discussion we saw about article 200, right? So what are the options given there? The governor can give the assent, he can withhold the assent, he can return the bill or he can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. So one of these options mentioned in article 200 should be exercised just because there is no timeline for the governor to decide the question of assent he cannot sit on the bill indefinitely and this should be ensured see all the constitutional authorities are required to act in a reasonable manner why is this this is because unreasonable acts are unsustainable in law so that's all about this news article In this discussion we saw about giving assent to the bills and what are all the powers that can be exercised by the governor while giving assent to the bill and we also saw the exceptions and the issues in it and how should the governor act while giving the assent to the bill so with these key learn points let us move on to the next article discussion see this news article it talks about a notice issued to the chatisgarh minister by national commission for women See let's not get deep into the issue here instead let us learn about the national commission for women see that is only important for us in the examination perspective first of all let us start the discussion with a brief history about the commission see nearly 5 decades ago the committee on the status of women in india recommended the setting up of an national commission for women they believed that The commission will facilitate redressal of grievances and accelerate the socio-economic development of women. And after this, later successive committees including the National Perspective Plan for Women 1988 to 2000 recommended the constitution of an apex body for women. So considering all of these recommendations, the National Commission for Women was set up as a statutory body in January 1992. and it was established under the national commission for women act 1990 see the first commission was constituted on 31st january 1992 with mrs jayanti patnayak as the chairman now coming to the composition the commission consists of a chairman a member secretary and five other members see the chairman of the national commission for women is nominated by the central government so this is about the composition Now what is the mission of this commission See its mission is to strive towards enabling women to achieve equality equal participation in all spheres of life See this is done by securing due rights and entitlements through suitable policy formulation and legislative measures etc So this is the mission of the commission Now what are all the functions of the commission The functions include reviewing the constitutional and legal safeguards for women, recommending remedial legislative measures and facilitating redressal of grievances and advising the government on all policy matters affecting women. See the commission it takes up the issue of child marriage, sponsored legal awareness programs 
పారివారిక్ మహిళ లోక్ అదాలత్ and it also reviews laws under dowry prohibition act 1961 pre conception and prenatal diagnostic techniques act 1994 indian penal code 1860 so in these lines it receives a large number of complaints and even the commission had acted suyomoto at times in several cases to provide speedy justice so this is about the commission's origin or history the composition the mission and the functions see this is a very important commission take note of it and you also go and search some facts about it now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion see this article here it states that muthoot finance limited will rise up to 300 crore by issuing non convertible debentures which is shortly referred as ncds See this NCDs have been rated AA+ by the ICRA which denotes a high degree of safety. So in this context let us discuss about debentures ICRA from prelims point of view. See a debenture is a medium to long term debt instrument used by large companies to borrow money at a fixed rate of interest. A debt instrument is nothing but a paper or electronic legal obligation that enables the issuer to raise funds by promising to repay the lender. So debenture is nothing but it is an instrument issued by someone who is borrowing money. Now who can issue these debentures? Both corporations and governments can issue debentures to raise capital. know that unlike the bonds debentures have no collateral backing so the interest rate rely on the credit worthiness and the reputation of the issuer see there are many types of debentures as you can see in this image here but today we are going to discuss about the classification of debentures on the basis of convertibility so on this basis there are two types of debentures one is convertible debentures and the other one is non convertible debentures see we are going to concentrate about this category only because non convertible debentures only appeared in news today now let us see them one by one see convertible debentures it is a type of debt that can be converted into equity shares of the issuing corporation see in debt finance the company is required to repay the money plus the interest over the period of time but in equity finance there is no repayment obligation instead equity financing involves selling a portion of company's equity in return for the capital here equity denotes shares of the company so convertible debentures are attractive to investors who wants to convert to equity if they believe that the company's stock will rise in the long term However, the ability to convert to equity comes at a price because convertible debentures pay a lower interest rate compared to other fixed rate investments. So this is one drawback. But the silver lining here is that they acquire the equity of the company that is the shares of the company. Now coming to the non-convertible debentures, they are the debentures that cannot be converted into equity of the issuing corporation. See to compensate for the lack of convertibility investors are rewarded with higher interest rate when compared to the convertible debentures See we already saw that debentures have no collateral backing and the interest rate rely on the credit worthiness and the reputation of the issuer So from this we can conclude that the credit rating of the company impacts the interest rate that the investors will receive and here only the credit rating agencies comes into play i'll tell you later why we are discussing about credit rating agencies now but before that we'll see what the credit rating agencies will do see credit rating agencies measure the credit worthiness of the corporate and the government and there are many credit rating agencies in india and icra is one among them now you know why we saw about credit rating agencies See in news today we saw that ICRA rated the debentures as AA+ and this rating denotes that debentures have high degree of safety. So in this context we'll see about ICRA in detail. See ICRA is nothing but Investment Information and Credit Rating Agencies of India shortly referred as ICRA. 
It is an independent credit rating agency. It was set up in the year 1991 by leading financial or investment institutions, commercial banks and financial services companies. It is headquartered in Gurugram, Haryana. Today, ICRA is a public limited company with its shares listed on both Bombay Stock Exchange and the National Stock Exchange. See this ICRA it has four main functions. Firstly, it provides information and guidance to the institutional and individual investors or creditors. Secondly, it enhances the ability of borrowers or the issuers to access the money market and the capital market. Thirdly, it assists the regulators in promoting transparency in the financial markets. And lastly, it provides intermediaries with the tool to improve efficiency in the funds raising process. So these are the four main functions of the ICRA. And with this we have also come to the end of this discussion. In this discussion we saw about debenture, classification of debentures and we saw who can issue debentures. And finally we ended our discussion by seeing the credit rating agency ICRA, some information about it and its main functions. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have four prelims questions, I will solve three of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now let us take this first question for solving. Consider the following statements with reference to entangled quantum state. Statement 1, two particles behave like a single unit even when they are separated. See, after reading the statement and the question, we can somewhat relate it to quantum physics, right? See, quantum physics is the study of matter and energy at the most fundamental level. It aims to uncover the properties and behaviors of the very building blocks of nature. This is the quantum physics. But the question has asked for the entangled quantum state. So, what is entangled quantum state? See, quantum entanglement is nothing but spooky action at a distance, meaning any tiny particles of light which is barely visible to the naked eye can be entangled and they can behave like a single unit. And this can happen even when they are separated by large distances. If you know about this quantum entanglement, then you know that the statement 1 is correct. Statement 1 also says that two particles behave like a single unit even when they are separated. Now coming to statement 2, due to their vast separation, a change induced in one will not affect the other. See this statement 2 is wrong. The characteristics of the quantum entanglement is that despite their vast separation, that is vast distance between the two particles, a change induced in one will definitely affect the other. See, the three scientists who got the Nobel Prize for Physics have conducted groundbreaking experiments using this entangled quantum states. And they have identified the correlation between the particles in an entangled pair. And that's why they have won Nobel Prize for Physics this year. Now coming to our question. We saw that statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect. So the correct answer here is option A, one only. Now moving on to the second question, consider the following statements. Statement 1, human evolution is a quick process by which humans evolved from their ape-like ancestors. See, after seeing the quick process itself, you can come to the conclusion that statement 1 is incorrect because human evolution is a long process. Now coming to statement 2, amphibians evolved into reptiles. See this statement is correct. This is taken from NCRT. See amphibians which evolved into reptiles, they lay thick shelled eggs which do not dry up in the sun. So the second statement is correct. Now coming to the third statement, analogous organs arise due to convergent evolution. See there are two types, convergent evolution and divergent evolution. Now homology is based on divergent evolution and analogy is based on convergent evolution. I will tell you in detail. See in homology the structures are same but the functions are different. See the difference in function is because of their divergent habitat or it may be because of divergent feeding habit or it may be because of any other difference among them. 
and hence it is said that homology is based on divergent evolution i'll give you an example here see whales bats cheetah human they are all mammals and they share similarities in the patterns of bones of four limbs so here the structure is same but how all of these animals use their four limbs is different see the function is different here and this is homology and in analogy the structures are different but they have the same function here let us take the example of wings of butterfly and wings of birds do they look alike no right they are not anatomically similar they look very different but they perform similar functions and hence analogous structures are a result of convergent evolution so from this we know that statement 3 is also correct now be very careful here what has the question asked the question has asked for the incorrect statements so the correct answer here is option a one only because we found that statement one only is incorrect now moving on to the third question consider the following statements with reference to national commission for women statement 1 both the members and chairman of the commission are nominated by the central government statement 2 the tenure of both the chairperson and every member shall not exceed 3 years see before solving the question let us see some facts regarding the composition of national commission for women see as per the national commission for women act the commission shall consist of a chairperson committed to the cause of women to be nominated by the central government and there shall be five members nominated by central government from among the persons of ability integrity and standing who have had experience in law or legislation trade unionism management of an industry or organization committed to increasing the employment potential of women women's voluntary organizations administration economic development health education or social welfare so the five members they should be among the persons having these qualities and provided that at least one member shall be from amongst persons belonging to scheduled caste and scheduled tribe respectively so this is about the members and chair person and the member secretary he also will be nominated by the central government and he should be an expert in the field of management organizational structure or sociological movement or he should be an officer who is a member of a civil service of the union or of an all india service or holds a civil post under the union with appropriate experience so this is about the composition now coming to the term of office and conditions of service of the chair person and members see the chair person and every member shall hold office for such period not exceeding 3 years as may be specified by the central government in this behalf so these are all the facts that are given in the act now read the statements again first statement says that members and the chair person they are nominated by the central government the statement is correct and the second statement is about the tenure it says that the tenure of the chair person and every member shall not exceed 3 years and this statement is also correct so the correct answer here is option c both 1 and 2 now coming to the final question this is the quiz question for you see this is a previous year question most recent one this is asked in the year 2022 read the question carefully try to attempt it and post your answer in the comment section i have displayed here a mains question so interested aspirants write it and post your answer in the comment section and if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar ai's academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you